Taking risks, smashing stuff up, that was very much part of the discovery journey for many young people who turned out to be laureates. How do you make a Nobel Prize laureate? In this special bonus episode of Nobel Prize Conversations, we explore the origin stories of these remarkable individuals. I'm Karin Svensson, producer of this podcast, and in this episode I trace the beginnings of laureates-to-be together with our host-turned-guest, Adam Smith, Chief Scientific Officer at Nobel Prize Outreach. Both nature and nurture play crucial parts in creating a Nobel Prize laureate. But there's another often overlooked factor that can shape their lives and careers, the element of chance. These many, 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 many pieces of luck throughout life come to make you what you are. This podcast was produced in cooperation with Fundación Ramón Areces. When we sit down to talk, Adam has just returned to London from a Nobel Prize dialogue event in Singapore, where young people from the Asia-Pacific region were brought together with Nobel Prize laureates to explore new paths to a better future. We start the conversation by discussing 2021 medicine laureate David Julius, who was constantly taking things apart as a child. He and his brother were elated when a truck crashed in their Brooklyn neighborhood, leaving behind a big pile of broken Etch-a-Sketches. Can you explain what an Etch-a-Sketch is, Adam? Yes, an Etch-a-Sketch is a toy that I think many of us saw when we were young, which has two knobs on the front which you can twiddle, and one controls horizontal direction and the other controls vertical direction of a little pen-like thing that's on the underside of a screen in front of you. And when you move the pen, it removes little grains that are electrostatically stuck to the screen in front of you. And so you can draw pictures with Etch-a-Sketches, usually in rather kind of vertical or horizontal direction. You have to get quite good at Etch-a-Sketch to start putting in the diagonals. (laughs) Right. So let's listen to David Julius talk about this incident. We sat there on the sidewalk, you know, with all these Etch-a-Sketches that had been thrown in the garbage can with a hammer, breaking the front glass and then pouring the silver paint into these jars so we could take it home because we thought it was, you know, mercury. Wouldn't that be cool to have all this mercury? So we dragged it all home. You know, we looked like the Tin Man. We were covered in, you know, silver paint. When my mother got home from work, you know, at the end of a busy day, here we are, these two kids, you know. She called my father on the phone and said, what do I do? Well, you got to clean him off with turpentine, you know. But when he got home, he was pretty cool about it. He just said, <laughs> he said, well, I'm glad it wasn't mercury. So, yeah, we got to do crazy stuff like that and get away with it. It's a lovely clip. I think lots of kids take things apart, but maybe laureates take things apart more than others. Some laureates blow things apart. There's quite a few laureates who used to play with explosives as children. And depending on how you describe it, you could say that they were learning about chemistry, doing practicals, being frightfully uh, scientific in their method. But you could also say that they were just blowing things up. Lou Ignaro, the medicine laureate, perhaps took it further than anybody else in that he eventually uh, blew up a whole pier, or at least one concrete pillar of a pier. And then there was um, uh, there was a physics laureate called Richard Taylor, who uh, worked on fundamental particles, he actually uh, was missing the top two joints of his index finger, I think it was, on his right hand. And they'd been blown off in a basement chemistry experiment when he was a kid. So I think taking risks, smashing stuff up, um, that was very much part of the discovery journey for many young people who turned out to be laureates. They sound like quite a challenge from a parenting perspective as well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I suppose pushing the boundaries, I mean whether they're scientists or laureates in literature or certainly peace laureates, I suppose pushing the boundaries is what you do. That's what makes the work different enough that it you get something new out of it, whether it's peacemaking or whether it's um, some new discovery. Not accepting things as they are perhaps means also breaking a few rules. <laughs> but what do you think from speaking to tons and tons of laureates, what have you learned about successful parenting in terms of how their parents help them achieve their potential? That's such an interesting question. 
I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I could apply it. It's always difficult, isn't it? Because there's no simple answer. In many cases, the laureates, I suppose, were given the latitude by their parents to be explorative, to go out and discover things. And as with David Julius's clip, you're allowed to cover yourself in silver paint and nobody makes too much of a fuss. And maybe in other laureates' case, you're allowed to blow things up and people don't make too much of a fuss. Before Lou blew up the pier, he blew up a chest of drawers in his basement and apparently his dad didn't say anything about it, just sort of thought, well done. What an interesting thing to have done. I'm not sure his mum thought the same because she had to find someone new to put the clothes. This is how he tells the story in a very kind of traditional family way. But there are also laureates out there who respected their parents and listened to them very carefully. I think of Bruce Beutler, who speaks so often of how he sort of listened to the wisdom of his father and almost sort of sat at the feet of his father and picked up this wisdom, and it obviously has served him very well in life. So I, you couldn't say that laureates either ignore their parents or are let free by their parents to do their own thing or follow their parents' instructions. I guess every parent-child relationship is individual and I suppose what you could say is that in most laureates' cases, it seems to have worked in that, you know, somehow, at least, the adult who came out of that child found their way in life and has done something important, which means that I suppose parents got something right, if the parents have anything to do with it. I have a favourite story about a parent's influence, in this case a mother, from 2017 physics laureate Kip Thorne. Should we listen to it? Yeah, please. We did a little project. She showed, walked me through scaling the actual sizes of the sun and the planets and distances between them down to a scale of our local neighborhood. So we uh, drew in chalk the sun on the corner sidewalk in front of the house. And uh, then the planets on down the street and Pluto was in the next town. And uh, <laughs> that was really quite startling. <laughs> And the yeah. plants were so tiny compared to this four-foot sun. The drawing of the solar system on the sidewalk is very clever. I suppose what it emphasises is just how much space there is around in between the objects. And that's... that's Precisely. And, and to see that at age eight is uh, profoundly uh, intriguing, exciting. So what does this story tell us about the role of parents? Hmm. I suppose it tells us that parents should try things out. Because I think what's interesting about that is both that Kip's mother took the trouble to do that, but also that he paid attention to it and it grabbed him and mattered to him. Because, you know, many schools do a similar project, actually. They hang up an orange and an apple and a football and say, this is a solar system. And, and sometimes, you know, they, they, they get the distances right. And kids look at it and enjoy it, but they're not switched on by it particularly. Kip Thorne was obviously very much switched on by that. And it's finding the thing that will switch somebody on. And, and I suppose one thing about laureates, which I've often thought, is that in a way they're extremely lucky because at some point in life, they have become extraordinarily switched on to something. They have found something that they have no trouble focusing on. It's just a joy to them to think about it. They want to work at it for years and years and years. And at least the way they tell it in retrospect, it's usually been a great pleasure to have pursued that path. I mean, I'm sure, actually, if you looked at it from the forward direction, there'd been many times that they might have um, forgotten <laughs> about in the kind of through the rosy haze of history um, that were very difficult and they weren't quite as happy about it all as they say they were now. But they have been very fortunate to find something that just absorbs them so much. And so parents can keep presenting their children with possibilities to get excited. And if the children are lucky, if the parents are lucky, some of this stuff will really gel and then a lucky child to have found their way. Schooling is another interesting topic, I think. And, and let's listen to two laureates with very different school experiences. 2020 physics laureate Andrea Gez, who went to a progressive school in Chicago, and 2021 economic sciences laureate David Card, who grew up on a farm in Ontario, Canada. There was a rural school with, um, in the area that had been built in the 1860s, maybe. 
it's still there, but at the time I went, it, it had um, big open room and five rows and each grade was a row, <laughs> <laughs> which was good, you know, because if you were a little advanced, I, by the time I got to first grade, I could read pretty well and I could basically follow along, you know, for our grade wasn't too interesting. Watch what were they doing in second grade, third grade, you know, <laughs> you could kind of advance along. And so that allowed me to skip a grade. I basically one year just moved over a row. <laughs> I went to a school that was all about asking questions and not teaching facts. It was developed by John Dewey, who was an educator who really believed in teaching people to learn rather than teaching people the facts. I am certainly a product of an educational model that is all about teaching people to think. The facts, you know, the facts will change. If you teach people to question Uh, which is ultimately what we need to do as basic scientists and actually as people. We need to question the world in which we live. (laughs) It's coming back to this question of, you know, critical thinking um, that's Mm. so critical at this moment. Yeah, I was fortunate. So I was fortunate to be to be educated um, in this manner. Very different experiences. Yeah, very different. What does that show us? I mean, for one thing, skipping a grade, I think a lot of Nobel laureates were good at school and often excelled at school. But being made to think, being taught to think, obviously there's a huge focus on that generally now, especially with the world in the state it is in. So many people understand that it's an absolute necessity that people learn to think critically. They don't just accept what they're told, that they learn to judge information, weigh information. That's always a good thing. I suppose that... um, Many laureates, I mean, I don't want to overuse the word luck, maybe just to slightly change it. They are blessed by having a mind that naturally questions things. Obviously, Andrea was talking about a school system that developed that sense of questioning, but I suspect that she already was the sort of person who would question things. And I remember hearing a story from a physicist who um, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in the 50s, I think in 1957, called T.D. Lee. And he got it at an extraordinarily young age. And he was actually a refugee. And at the age of 16, he first encountered Newton's laws in a textbook. And he hadn't seen them before. So it was maybe a little bit later than many people were introduced to them. And the extraordinary thing is he said that when he read them, he thought, no, that can't be true. And that's such an odd reaction to Newton's laws because all of us have been exposed to them at some level at school in physics class. And I suspect everybody listening has just said, OK, that's Newton's laws, right, got to learn those. And to say, ah, oh, those are Newton's laws, but is that right, is a very different approach and indicative of a mind that is doing something different from at least mine. That ability to question, I think, is partly something that you can teach but it's also something that uh, is innate to a certain extent. But there are also examples of laureates who've struggled in school, at least initially. And Mm. one of them is 2020 Economic Sciences laureate Paul Milgram. I could only concentrate on things that I thought were interesting. And um, I remember trying so hard to learn to concentrate as a child. And I remember when I was trying to force myself to read uh, assignments and I'd sit down and I wouldn't let myself uh, get up and I'd read a book for 20 minutes and then I'd stop and say, what did I read? And I had no idea. I mean, the thing is, it just went in and out. My, my eyes were going over the page, but I just couldn't concentrate on, couldn't hold the things in front of me. So, so no, it didn't happen as a child. I think fortunately, one of the things that's happened is now um, I do spend almost all of my time working on stuff I'm interested in. And that makes it a lot easier to concentrate. So uh, um, maybe it's just um, that I've been able to focus on stuff that I really enjoy that's made the concentration possible. He's not the only one who's had this experience, right? Not at all, no. I don't think that um, all laureates were fully formed in school and some some missed school entirely. They started later. You meet uh, laureates who failed courses and all that sort of thing. But he said it, it all comes down to finding something interesting enough to hold your concentration. Of course, there are those who are interested in everything at school and just excelled across the board. But I suppose, given that there's every different type of child coming into school, I suppose school's job ought to be 
to find what it is that makes the child interested and to let them go down that route. But uh, that individualised approach is obviously something we're far away from having at the moment. Do you have any other favourite stories about Laureate's failing at school? I mean, so there's the example of Mario Capecchi, who was awarded the Medicine Prize in 2007. And he, along with Martin Evans and Oliver Smithies, were responsible for creating the transgenic mouse, uh, which is sort of the backbone of mammalian genetics studies. But uh, he'd been born into the war and he'd lost his parents. He just got separated from them in the war. And so for, I think, four years, he wandered as a child in Italy, living on the streets. And I think it was between something like the ages of six and ten. So he completely missed out on all education for that period. And then uh, when the war ended, he was reunited with his family and they moved to America and he went into education. And actually, he did well at school then. But, you know, it's interesting that you can blow such a hole in somebody's education in what would seem to be very formative years. And it didn't seem to have stopped him at all. So I suppose it just shows that, um, you know, there's no right way of doing it. It can work whether you just have a lovely, simple schooling where you excel at everything and it's all great. You skip grades and move up fast. Or whether you have a bit of a laborious education and uh, come out the end somehow okay. (laughs) What would you say are the basic personality traits that will stand you in good stead if you want to win a Nobel Prize? Well, it's difficult because I think... uh, I mean, much of the work I do, I do to try and reveal how different the personalities (laughs) of Nobel laureates are. So if you ask what the personality traits are, I'd say encouragingly, I think that you can have almost any personality trait and be a Nobel (laughs) laureate. Maybe an important trait is the drive to find things out for yourself, a great curiosity and a need to satisfy it. And I wanted to listen to the 1998 chemistry laureate, Hartmut Mikkel, who grew up in a working class family with no academic background. It was mainly that I went, maybe age 10 or 11, I went to the lending library of the city and I started to read quite a lot. So I I read about uh, four books a week, partly science, quite often foreign countries, history, geology, chemistry, and so on. At the end, I ended up that my favorite field was chemistry. This sounds like it was entirely self-driven. It was just a, a desire, a curiosity. Oh, it was curiosity. I always wanted to find out how things work mm. and how they are composed. Well, how lovely that the library was there to satisfy your curiosity. So chemistry grabbed you from the books? Not only chemistry, as I said, foreign countries. I read every book which I could get about New Guinea, also about Ethiopia, <laughs> also about the Amazon River. And I was sitting quite often in front of a book and having a look at the map of Amazon and reading that I was there. This really warms my heart as uh, public libraries are my favourite spaces. But how important is basic curiosity, you think? I think basic curiosity is clearly incredibly important. You know, Hartmut Mikkel is an interesting example because what he's describing is just an appetite for knowledge generally when he was young. And that's very strong. I would say now you certainly um, see Hartmut having a, a great interest in all sorts of different aspects of life. But I would say that the place where his curiosity is most evident is in asking questions that most people don't ask about things that are close to his interests. So that, for instance, he worked on photosynthesis. That's what his Nobel Prize was given for. And he's very interested in the question of biofuels and whether biofuels are a good way to go or not a good way to go. And much earlier than most people, he was suggesting that they weren't a very sensible way of producing alternative energy sources. And that was because he was asking the right questions about the energy it requires to make biofuels and how much you get out of them and what else you can do with the land that you're using to make biofuels, all related back really to the process of photosynthesis. So it's applied curiosity. Maybe laureates start with a great wealth of it that's applied all over the place. But why it becomes truly useful 
and why that curiosity eventually gets rewarded with a Nobel Prize is because they learn how to apply their curiosity to something that they're really interested in. And I know lots of curious people. I know lots of people out there who ask a lot of questions. I think I'm quite curious. I think I am interested in lots of different aspects of life. But on the other hand, I certainly don't have the dedication to apply that interest to one thing, or at least one small group of things. And that's what differentiates them. I think curiosity is something we definitely need to preserve. And it's, and it's true that children have it and adults in general lose at least a lot of what they had. I still don't think that the world lacks curious people and the world doesn't lack focused people. But perhaps we could do with more people who are both curious and focused. In 2018, physics laureate Donna Strickland's fate was sealed during conversation with a friend on the way to school. So let's listen to her origin story. It had been my life's goal to get a PhD. And so for the first three years of my PhD, when people would say, what are you going to do next? I went, I don't know. This is my whole life's goal is to get this PhD. So it wasn't a thing that I wanted to be this kind of scientist or I... It was, you know, I had knew I belonged in school and wanted to get a PhD. So what made it your life skill? I don't know. I, like you said, I was a nerdy little kid, one of those awful kids that, you know, were perfectly happy to have summer vacation over and going back to school. And I remember just hearing from a friend walking to school one day that his older brother was going to go for his PhD. And I asked what it was. Now, I don't quite remember the conversation because I doubt this child used the word, it's the ultimate in education. But whatever words as a young person would use, that's the feeling I got. And I went, oh, well, then if that's the ultimate in education and I love school, then I will get, without even knowing what it was, that was just in my heart and soul from that time on, I would get a PhD. Before I even knew what it was, I, I knew I belonged. She also talks about how she was only good at math and physics, so choosing the subject was the easy part. <laughs> But it's funny to think about a child dreaming about a PhD, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, it seems quite random, doesn't it? <laughs> But I suppose it's, you know, it, we, we all latch on to something that we hope will define us at school. I, at some point, you suddenly realise you can I don't know, play football well and you're going to get into the team. And probably on one day you suddenly realise that, hey, you can make the first team. Or one day you suddenly think, I'm really good at maths. I'm going to get a good grade here. It's this having the possibility of discovering who you are and getting these lucky breaks along the way where you, you see that the path is, at least to the next stage, is clear. And yeah, it's totally random, her picking up on the words PhD, not knowing what they were, and saying, that sounds good. I'm going to be the ultimate in education. But obviously, she must have already been thinking, I like school. I'm good at school. I'm going to do best at school. That's what I'm going to do. And okay, doing best at school means get a PhD. Fine. Okay, that's what I'm going to do then. So it's, it's all part of this same process of self-discovery. Assembling your identity in a way, finding the pieces. Yeah, absolutely. What a lovely word to bring into it, identity, because that's That really sums up a lot of what a laureate is. It's the work and the personality. It's all part of their identity. It's not that they've, you know, there's some species of person who you come and you apply to a problem and you say, here, we've got this very, very sort of special sort of personality and here we have a very complicated problem. So we'll take this personality from over here and we'll put them on this problem And somehow it's going to work because we know that this is the right personality for this problem. It's that the two co-evolve, that the person and the question grow up together, finding each other, and somehow get knitted together into the identity of the laureate. And, and you know, we could be talking about the identity of anybody else in the world who we were interested in, whose aspirations and personality have knitted together to create somebody who's driven to do something wonderful. So it's all about the identity forming in the right way that uh, allows you to contribute to society in some amazing way. I love the word identity. Mm -hmm. yes, I'm thinking this, this identity can also be formed by traumatic events. There are plenty of examples among laureates, like 2018 medicine laureate James Allison. He's talked about how losing his mother to cancer at age 10 had a massive impact on his career choice. And let's listen to two laureates whose lives have been shaped by civil war. 2021 medicine laureate Adam Patapushan, who fled Lebanon as a teenager during the war, and 2011 peace laureate Lima Bowie, 
whose idyllic childhood came to an abrupt end with the start of the Liberian Civil War. July of 1990, I woke up a 18-year-old, ready to go to university. And by 10 o'clock in the afternoon, I became an adult because the shooting had taken over our entire community. I had to make decisions on where we hide what, how to take care of people, what, what, what. So one minute I was a teenager and the next minute I was a woman. And I tell people, I've never gone back to any of those. When the shooting started that afternoon, my nieces and nephew who mother lived somewhere else were out playing. And when the gunfire, people were running. I was inside, so I had to run outside. Bullets were raining. Collect all of them, take them inside and put them away from the windows. So they're sitting in the hallway. And then my auntie comes to me and say, your parents are not here this is their house. You are in charge now. I was going to a, a party with friends and I stayed over at a friend's house. And the next morning I was walking over to West Beirut where we lived and I heard snipers. And as I heard that, I ran across the green line and there were a bunch of guys with guns looking at this 18-year-old guy running across the border. Didn't look good. So they called me over and questioned me for a few hours. And um, it was a very scary time for me. And when they finally released me that day, I came home and I said, that's it, I'm out of here. So so what can we learn from their stories? How, how can this kind of hardship influence one's direction or drive, you think? Um, it's a fascinating couple of clips to put together because in a way their reactions to the situation were almost opposite that the hideous sort of terrifying event of when crossing the green line for Adam Pataputian made him decide finally I'm out of here and for Lima Bowie who may of course not have had the possibility or seen the possibility of getting out of there for her it, it meant really dealing with the situation that was around her and growing up and and eventually becoming a peace activist in Liberia. So one decided to leave and the other stayed to effect. But at the same time, I suppose that what it shows us is that if it illustrates anything, maybe it illustrates that, again, an event isn't an event in isolation. It's an event on a journey to finding out who you are. And so it meant that Adam Pataputian moved to the US just as he was... um, at the early stages of his university studies and had various experiences on arrival that helped to form him further. And he eventually, to his surprise, found himself as a a life science researcher with an amazing gift, but he didn't expect to be that person at all. And I'm sure that Lima Bowie didn't expect to become a peace activist, especially not so, so young as when that happened to her. But it just shows that these events can help push you along a path that is developing in you, but it's all part of the collected experience and how that collected experience influences the person you innately are. So I think there's no recipe is what I'm saying. Mm. It's really interesting to see all this, but it just serves, as I read it, to illustrate that there is obviously this wonderful potential to be discovered in all these people and they're all different. And somehow things fall together to allow them to be in a situation where they can do extraordinary things. Most of us, unfortunately in life, I suppose, miss those cues that might also happen to us. And we go down different paths and we live interesting and wonderful lives and fulfilling lives and we influence each other and all have, you know, everybody has profound effects on everybody around them and maybe even on the wider society, many people. But it's only a few who somehow it falls together that they can do something very, very substantial. And then a tiny fraction of those people who do substantial things get the Nobel Prize and we focus on them. (laughs) We have another example, a favourite of mine, that's 2017 chemistry laureate Joachim Frank, who was also a child of war growing up in Germany in the 1940s. And it shaped his identity in unexpected ways. My first, you know, real memories were to play on uh, in the rubble of uh, ruins right next door 
were ruins and there were fantastic discoveries of electric circuits, uh, bakelite boxes, fuse boxes, uh, copper wire. It was beautiful, beautiful playground. So to this day, I'm attracted and disturbed at the same time by anything that is chaotic. There is something about the rubble and the, and the ruins that made me think that maybe this was a key for me to search for order, to make up the world uh, or to remake the world in, in some kind of a rational way. And so that would be the key to finding satisfaction in a science career. What are your thoughts on his reasoning here? <laughs> well, it really applies to him very well, doesn't it? Because his work was uh, that he was awarded the Nobel Prize for was to somehow assemble structure out of what appear at first sight to be incredibly chaotic images, incredibly chaotic information coming out of um, electron microscopes. And the algorithms he used to reassemble that information into three-dimensional structures are absolutely extraordinary. So if anybody, yes, is creating order out of chaos, I think Joachim Frank is the one. But there's more to that story, isn't there? Because it's not just that he was affected by chaos, which is, as you say, so interesting. It's also that he was finding stuff to play with in the rubble and making things. And that's a very, at least among science laureates, that's a very common shared experience that they, they fiddled with stuff. They either took things apart, as we were talking about, or they put things together, made crystal set radios in the old days or played with Meccano, all that sort of thing. There's a lot of using your hands and your brain to assemble and disassemble technology. And that obviously has contributed to them having an understanding of science that was very important. Choosing your particular field as a future Nobel laureate can have both mundane and profound reasons. And I think a good example of this is 2021 chemistry laureate David McMillan. He started out as a physics student, but changed his path after one year at university. Let's listen. The first lecture was really early in the morning. And you would go into this physics lecture theater, and it was absolutely freezing. When it would rain, all this rain would come in through the roof, and you would just be getting soaked, sitting. And this was miserable. But an hour after that, though, I was also I had to do chemistry as my sort of minor. And so I would go into the chemistry lecture theater, and it was really nice and warm. And I was like, wow, you know. So at this point, I'm like, well, I could literally stay in bed an hour longer, and it'd be a lot warmer if I just switched over to, to chemistry. And it turns out there was more than how simple I'm making it sound, but it was also we started to do organic chemistry. And that was the first time in my life I ever read or was in, involved with a part of education or, or science where it was just reading it was amazing. I mean, it was just like, wow, this is really, really great. A lot of organic chemists will say this. It sounds a bit you know, pretentious, but, it, but it's true, is that organic chemistry sort of found me as much as I found it. And so for me, it was almost like I love this subject. And at the same time, it was this beautifully warm lecture theatre. So in my second year, I announced I was moving to chemistry. That was it. So two different things, just wanting a warm place to study and being uh, seduced by a subject. I can really relate to the warm place to study. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can absolutely see that. And what a good reason to choose a field. <laughs> <laughs> you know, practicality comes into it as well. It's not all hardship and struggling. It could just be a pragmatic choice. Let's do that for a while. Yeah, personally, um, an hour extra sleep for me would, would do it any time. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would be big for me too. I can really relate to the chemistry thing too because I didn't get that experience of organic <laughs> chemistry. I, I studied organic chemistry and it was always for me an intellectual exercise, an intellectual struggle that you could learn the reactions, you could learn how things fitted together. But it never made beautiful sense. I saw people who encountered organic chemistry and just at some level understood it, at a level I didn't. And it is almost like um, a sort of uh, mystical art, you feel, because when you look at molecular structures, some people seem to be able to look at them and just, they fall apart in their mind's eye 
and reform in ways that indicate how you could make them. You can see the reactions that you need to put them together and then you can dream up structures and see the reactions that will go to assemble those. And it's a sort of magic that uh, it all makes sense and their minds are somehow receptive to fitting together the possibilities and the final product. A bit like playing chess or something, that somehow the moves all seem to explain themselves to you. Most of us look at a chessboard and, you know, you can think one or two moves ahead and then it all becomes, who knows what's going to happen. But chemists seem to be able to see many steps ahead. So I can see how it could happen to him. I can understand what he's talking about and marvel at it. Let's talk about role models. Uh, How important are they in shaping a Nobel laureate? Well, again, it varies. In some cases, some rare cases, people have found their path, especially in physics, so early that it's almost there wasn't even time to have a role model, really. Like T.D. Lee, the, you know, the one who questioned Newton. I think his prize came at the age of 31. Uh, his discovery had happened the year before. Wasn't much time to get too many role models, and he missed out on a lot of education. So I don't know where his role model came from. But yeah, he met people along the way, of course. I think it's incredibly important for most of them to have the right guidance when they're breaking free and becoming a an independent entity. They so frequently refer, when you ask them about role models, not so much to childhood role models, but the people who help them in what's normally, I suppose, their early 20s, when they're just changing from being a uh, somebody studying at university to somebody beginning to do their own work. And that matters greatly. So the mentorship that comes from somebody who helps you make your transition into independent research is obviously much, much more important than I ever thought it was when I was doing that transition myself. I think one of the most beautiful stories about role models comes from 2012 chemistry laureate Robert Lefkowitz. Let's listen. He was our family physician, a man named Dr. Feibusch, and he would make house calls. And he could see I was very interested Uh, He'd let me play with his stethoscope. Uh, He would let me see what was in his black bag. And then whatever he was doing, he would explain to me, explaining in very simple terms that, say, a seven or eight-year-old kid could understand uh, what the science was behind whatever it was. And that was it. I mean, by the time I was eight years old, I was absolutely convinced that I needed to be Dr. Feibusch. He was my role model. I realized years later that what I experienced definitely falls under the heading of what we call a calling. You can feel a calling to anything. The only requisite is that you experience it as a a sense that your destiny is to do a particular thing. And so I would say from age seven or eight on, I had absolutely no doubt that my destiny was to be a physician and to learn a lot about science and biology and then apply that to making people feel better. How do you feel about his sentiments here? Well, um, we've referred to it before, but in a way, how how lucky to meet Dr. Feibusch and how lucky to be the sort of person who responded to Dr. Feibusch, and to be called by him, if mm. you like. But then in Bob's case, he, as a young doctor, just sort of learning to become a doctor, like many of his peers was keen not to be sent to the Vietnam War as a doctor and applied instead to do research at the National Institutes of Health. And he was successful. Together with this incredibly talented group of young people who then went on to do amazing work. And there's a funny lineage that you can trace back that there are many Nobel laureates in uh, medicine and in chemistry who all went to the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, just outside Washington, D.C., in that period of the Vietnam War and trained together. There was something magical about that little generation of MD-PhD candidates. And the point there is that in a way, they must all have been mentoring each other, that they were very highly selected because there were so many doctors who wanted not to be sent to Vietnam that there was, I think, a a wealth of people to choose from. And NIH obviously picked very wisely and chose some really wonderful people to bring in. They say themselves that they were avoiding the draft, um, and they jokingly refer to each other as the yellow berets, um, uh, which is, you know, tongue-in-cheek. But the point about them was that they were talented, they were teaching each other, they were mentoring each other. 
and they all grew up together. So in Bob Lefkowitz's case, yes, he was so fortunate to encounter and so receptive to the encounter with this Dr. Feibusch. But then later on, he and his colleagues were mentoring each other in how to do research and how to become truly inspirational investigators of nature. So mentorship and role models are not, I think in most cases, just a one-off thing. It's that you, again, you're, you're lucky enough to encounter a collection of them. But there's also a parallel there between the lives that we all lead is that the people around us are the ones who create us. Mm, exactly. That, that isn't that interesting because I suppose that in order to do something that is different enough that people might think of giving the work, giving you the Nobel Prize, you have to be behaving differently to those around you so that you're being formed and created by the people around you. You're learning how to approach life from the people around you. And yet, at some point, you have to be different from the people around you so that you can do something different. And whether that's um, having the, the self-knowledge and bravery to become an advocate for peace in a place where everybody seems to be fighting each other, or whether it's that you approach a problem in an entirely new way. I don't know, I think of, for instance, Francis Arnold, who came from a mechanical engineering background into biology, looked at people who were trying to build enzymes and thought, as a mechanical engineer, that's a problem that looks far too complicated. I don't think they're ever going to succeed. But building new enzymes is a good idea. So how could you do it in a way that they're not thinking of? And she thought, well, maybe evolution can help. We can just allow evolution to evolve new enzymes in ways we want. And that worked. So it's partly being influenced by everyone around you to understand the problem and understand how to approach the problem and understand what matters and then it's having the foresight to think differently and make some jump to some new place. So if we're to sum up our quest for the uh, Nobel laureate's origin story in singular, then I would use the words luck and sort of the mysterious formation of our identity. Would you agree? <laughs> yes, luck and identity. Very good words. I think everybody who has achieved something great in life, or at least one would hope that everybody who's achieved something great in life recognises the part that luck played in that. And I'm certain that Nobel laureates understand that luck in the best sense has been very important to them. I don't mean the luck of who gets the prize, that, that sort of simplistic interpretation of the idea of luck. I mean the luck we've been talking about all through this, where you're lucky to encounter somebody who says something interesting and you're lucky that you happen to be receptive to that at that moment. And you're lucky that somehow an avenue opens up in front of you that suits you. And these many, 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 many pieces of luck throughout life come to make you what you are. And I think they all recognise that. And then fundamentally, of course, they recognise that whatever it is that they work on, they were lucky to find that problem. There could have been other problems. How do you decide whether you're going to work on some elusive crystal structure or, I don't know, trying to understand the nature of some complicated protein that sits in the cell membrane or whether you're going to go out and try and work out whether the universe is accelerating or decelerating in its expansion. You know, It could have been any problem, but this is the problem you chose and wasn't it fortunate that you chose a problem that turned out to be soluble, at least to a certain degree? But then all of that luck goes hand in hand with having the, the innate good taste to make the right decision at the right moment, to listen to that person or to follow that path, or to see that this particular problem that you've chosen is one that could be solved with the resources that might become available during your working lifetime. And so it's this combination of luck, good taste, and those come together, as you say, to form identity. I think also, you know, the fundamental truth, again, is that the Nobel laureate's origin story is that the Nobel Prize was created and <laughs> rewards a nice large array of different ways of doing work which is somehow different from what has gone before and reveals something different that has gone before. But in a way, the origin stories of Nobel laureates are not so different from the origin stories of so many other people who do important things. It's the creation of the Nobel Prize that is the origin of the fact that we're trying to differentiate 
a Nobel laureate from all these other important people. It's good because it makes us focus on stories around individual people who've done amazing things. So that's wonderful. But there isn't something that makes a Nobel laureate per se fundamentally different from other amazing people. That's comforting. I think it is comforting. <laughs> I think it is. I mean, yeah. And I th- that's what my work is, I think, uh, I define it as mostly about, actually, hmm. that I spend my time taking Nobel laureates around the place to show that they're wonderful and inspirational and extraordinary and fun to be with and, you know, um, just lovely to have around for all the right reasons. But they're not so, they're not a different species so that this 19-year-old person from Vietnam or Myanmar or Nepal, as we've just been talking to this last few days, it's not that they, that you couldn't be them. It's not that anybody couldn't be them. It's that with the right set of circumstances, you know, the right inner strength or whatever, and the, the will and the curiosity and all the rest of it, you could be like that. You just heard a bonus episode of Nobel Prize Conversations. If you enjoyed these stories, you won't want to miss our upcoming conversations with the 2022 laureates, published as they happen. Adam Smith will be among the first in the world to congratulate this year's new class of laureates. Subscribe today. This special season kicks off on October the 3rd. You can follow the 2022 Nobel Prize announcements on nobelprize.org with live streams and complete prize information. Nobel Prize Conversations is a podcast series with Adam Smith, a co-production of Filt and Nobel Prize Outreach. The producer and host for this episode was me, Karin Svensson. The editorial team also includes Andrew Hart, Olivia Lundqvist and Claire Brilliant. Music by Epidemic Sound. Thanks for listening. <laughs>